Hey YouTube, Mr. Terry back here once again for another History Teacher Reacts video. Thanks for joining me today in my quest to learn as much about history as possible. Um, today we are continuing on with uh, Extra History series on the uh, German battleship the Bismarck. Um, this is video two of mine. Um, if you did not see video one, I would check that out first. Um, that uh, goes over videos one and two of their series. What we're going to do in today is watching the final two videos. So that's number three and number four. So again, if you haven't seen that, um, I would probably watch that first and then hop over here and finish it up with me. All right, so um, before we begin, I want to make sure that you know that the original video's links uh, will be down below. If you like the video, make sure you go over there so you can like and subscribe to them and give them the credit that they deserve for a great video. All right, uh, without any more talk, I think let's go ahead and get going. So this is episode three, um, Hunting the Bismarck. This, is, this, is, uh, this one looks like it's called A Chance to Strike. So where we just left off is... Um, there was basically kind of like a two-on-two -two sort of battle here in um, um, near Denmark um, with uh, a couple of the biggest uh, of the um, British ships and then against the Bismarck, which is the biggest ship um, in the world, I, I believe, at this moment. Um, the only one that could compare with that was the um, Yamato uh, from Japan, but that may not be in commission quite yet at this exact moment, but will be. But anyways, um, yeah, this is the... Uh, um, biggest ship here at the moment it's really the crown jewel of the um uh the german navy here so it has just one battle um by uh, sinking one of the massive um british ships and uh creating or, and then leading the other one to have to flee as it's moving trying to get out to the uh, more to the north atlantic to uh, try to prey on merchant ships coming around britain so that's kind of where they had left off. Let's go ahead and jump right in. Maybe they begin with that, what I just said. I guess we'll see. But let's go ahead and jump in. Episode 3. With the hood sunk and the Prince of Wales damaged, nothing stands between the Bismarck and the Atlantic. But this is only the beginning of the Royal Navy's misfortunes. Oh, is it going to get worse? It's pretty bad. This is... I mean, this episode is ship. sponsored by Wargaming. Download World of Warships cool and use the code a, you know, Extra One for free goodies. Link episode in the with one of the most popular the ships ever. Twenty fourth of May, with fourteen forty hours. Most popular Admiral Toby's flagship, games. King George V. The Battle of the Denmark Strait has not only been a disaster for British morale, but it's presented a tactical problem. Bismarck and Prinz Eugen are loose in the Atlantic. Worse, the only ships close enough to engage the Germans are no match for those battleships. Instead so of intercepting chance, Bismarck, huh? Admiral Tovey's home fleet is now chasing her south. But thanks to the cruisers and their radar, they at least know where the Bismarck is, and reconnaissance planes have reported a large oil slick following the vessel. Leaking? It seems that one of the Prince of Wales's shells wounded the beast, but it hasn't slowed her. If Tovey hopes to catch up to Bismarck, he has to Leaking cause her further though. damage. He orders his aircraft carrier Victorious to steam ahead of him. She's a faster ship, and with luck, she can get her swordfish torpedo bombers within range of the enemy before dark. 1839 hours. The Prince of Wales and a squadron of cruisers have been shadowing Bismarck and Prince Eugen with their forward radar when one of the cruiser's lookouts spots something in the haze. Suddenly, Ooh. Bismarck cuts through the fog bank and opens up with her guns. The cruiser quickly turns and flees into the fog. Yeah. A mile behind it, the Prince of Wales fires a salvo. Battle seems imminent, but the Bismarck breaks off and continues north. When the cruiser yeah, you don't reacquires Bismarck, want to engage it's it. the Bismarck this, that there's The Bismarck, remember, the Bismarck's primary goal is to is to get out of here. Um, to get west of Denmark, right? And out uh, more into the open seas of the northern Atlantic. Um, so it seems like, at least at this point, it just wants to engage in you know minimally for for what it needs to right now. Um, so yeah, they're trying to stop this thing from getting out there. That's what the British are, tr are trying to do here. There's only one ship on radar. When the cruiser reacquires Bismarck, its captain notices that there's only one ship on radar now, not two. The attack was a bluff, a ploy to break radar contact so Prince Eugen could detach and slip away. They've lost one prize. 2300 hours on the aircraft carrier Victorious. Nine swordfish torpedo bombers lift off the pitching deck. 
They are not fit for this mission. The pilots are inexperienced, the aircraft are biplanes with bodies made of metal struts and stretched fabric. They carry only one torpedo each, and their top speed is only 138 miles per hour. But they are the only solution it's available. Really fast, the squadron really reaches fast. the target area and sees a ship below. Then these rookie pilots begin an attack run that could change history. They dive low, a hundred feet above mm. the waves, and line up to create a bank of torpedoes that will be hard to thread. But the ship's anti-aircraft batteries aren't opening fire, and this ship seems a little small to be Bismarck. Flak lashes past the squadron. Like know it's coming from a different Bismarck. ship, ten miles distant. That's Bismarck. The swordfish pull go. out of their attack run and climb into the clouds, glimpsing the U.S. Coast Guard ensigns flying from the ship they'd nearly just sunk. U.S.-U.K. <laughs> relations are saved, but they've lost the element of surprise. That's weird. What if, yeah, what if, uh, what if that, um, if they had attacked it? It'd be hard to, uh, excuse that, right? You don't want to, not a time when you want to uh, mess with British-American relations, right? Imagine. Sunk. U.S.-U.K. relations are saved, but they've lost the element of surprise. The squadron drives towards the Bismarck in a storm of anti-aircraft fire. Tracer rounds zip past. The great 15-inch guns fire into the sea, creating walls of water a hundred feet high. Flak rips the bottom out of one plane, while another swordfish hits a pillar of spray and nearly stalls. But all the things that make swordfish obsolete also make them a perfect weapon in this case. Modern anti-aircraft batteries are designed to target faster planes, and the swordfish's low speed makes them easy to maneuver. <laughs> Their cloth skins and frames are so fragile that shells smash right through without detonating. The swordfish loose their torpedoes. The Bismarck slowly swerves, trying to thread the gap between the tinfish. It succeeds twice, but as the swordfish buzz away, they see a bright flash and a gush of water amidships, right on the thick armor belt. Likely no damage. 25th of May, 0115 hours. Under orders to engage, the Prince of Wales fires on Bismarck at extreme range, but the weather cuts visibility to nothing. The cruiser squadron resumes shadowing the Bismarck by radar, zigzagging to throw off the U-boats that Admiralty warns are in the area. During these evasive maneuvers, they lose and reacquire Bismarck every 20 minutes. At 0306 okay. hours, the lead cruiser has the Bismarck on radar and then turns away. When they turn back at 0330 hours, the Bismarck is gone. They search, but lost in vain. Enough. After shadowing her for 32 hours and a thousand miles, they've lost their quarry. 0600 hours on the King George the... You wonder how you could just lose something that big, but... I mean, these things... It's incredible how fast and agile was. I was talking earlier how I was, you know, trying to... Try to kind of, um... Yeah, thread the needle between the torpedoes that the planes are dropping. Can you imagine trying to um, to make these kind of turns and these maneuvers with such an enormous heavy ship? Uh, it's amazing you could even do that at all. And miles, they've lost their quarry. Oh, 0600 hours on the King George V, three hours since last contact. When Tovey learns that the cruisers have lost Bismarck, he goes to his charts. The oil slick reported behind Bismarck suggests that the ship is damaged, in which case, he reasons, it would try to return to port either in Norway or occupied France. But if Bismarck isn't badly damaged, it could link up with an oil tanker, and refuel, and play havoc with supply convoys. We don't know. This scares Tovey. His ships are already low on fuel, and if the search continues too long, they're gonna have to return home. If Bismarck finds a tanker, she could simply wait them out. He orders several of his cruisers, battleships, and the Victorious to refuel in Iceland. It'll mean he's short-handed in the meantime, but he'll have the option for a long-term search. If it comes down to it, he has the battleship Rodney in intercept position, just in case Bismarck heads for the French coast. 0930 hours at Bletchley Park. 6.5 hours have passed since last contact. Every day is a race for the code breakers at Bletchley Park. The settings so we're not talking about, just not much to react to at the day. moment. And every day, Bletchley just kind of it in. A huge computer runs through different settings until the intercepted messages turn into readable German. Once that happens, it's a scramble to decode as many intercepts as possible before the codes change again. 
Hut 4, the computer that deals with German naval signals, is trying to sort through a mountain of intercepts to find where Bismarck is headed. But the Bismarck isn't the only German vessel in the Atlantic, and because the naval version of the Enigma has five rotors instead of four, actual decryptions will take a week to come through. You know, I really enjoyed that movie, um, The Imitation Game, where they go over the crew or the, the team that was working on the Enigma and how challenging that was and stuff like that, and then... Um, uh, that was a really good film, though, if you're interested in that. In the absence of translations, the analysts try to identify Bismarck's signals by the electronic fingerprint of its transmitter and the typing style of the ship's Morse operator. If they find a signal that matches, they triangulate its position. The evidence is mixed. One triangulated signal seems headed for France, but other possible hits indicate Norway. But one analyst notices that the broadcasts being sent to the Bismarck have changed origin points. Until noon the previous day, signals to the Bismarck originated at a station in Germany, but now they're coming from Paris. This suggests hmm. that Bismarck has traveled out of the German station's range and is headed for France. They decide okay. to trust the French signal. They broadcast the raw data to Tovi, whose destroyers can triangulate the signals with their own equipment. 1047 hours on the King George V. Seven and a half hours since last contact. Tovey reviews the raw data indicating France, but in triangulating it, he makes a mathematical error. According mm -hmm. to his map, the Bismarck is headed north toward Norway. He orders all ships to search north of the Bismarck's last known position. 1,200 hours at the Admiralty. So they really don't know. Nine hours right since last contact. 200 feet below the Admiralty building in London, analysts are hotly debating the Bismarck's position. They are under pressure to deliver. Churchill is livid that the Bismarck has escaped. He's already requested that Captain Leach be court-martialed for breaking off his attack <laughs> after the sinking of Hood. The public, Classic the Churchill. media, and Parliament are pressing him for updates. But the best the analysts can do is make an educated guess. Over the morning, they send signals that they believe Bismarck is headed for France, but they order destroyers and cruisers to guard the passages around Iceland just in case. They try to cover their bases, stripping supply and troop convoys to dangerous levels. 1,700 hours at Bletchley Park. By now, 14 hours have passed since last contact. At Hut 6, a team of German-speaking women type intercepted messages into Enigma replicas and prioritize the decrypted results. They've been briefed to look for anything related to the Bismarck. One decoder sees the word Bress and freezes. It's a message sent from a Luftwaffe Enigma machine. The sender is a general asking whether his son, a sailor on Bismarck, has survived the battle with Hood. The reply is that all aboard Bismarck are safe and headed for Brest, Ooh. France. She shoots a hand up. I have something interesting. 18 the giveaway. 10 hours at the Admiralty. Giveaway. 15 hours since last contact. Signals go out to Admiral Tovey's flagship, the King George V. Determination hardened Bismarck headed for Brest. Tovey has been sailing in the wrong direction for hours. To lose the him. Admiralty orders land-based reconnaissance flights on all approaches to Bress. Nobody at sea or on land will sleep tonight. The 26th of May, 1035 hours, at PBY hmm. Catalina Patrol, 31 hours since last contact. Catalina flying boats, obtained from America via Lend-Lease, have been scouring the ocean since dawn. But in closely guarded secret, the pilot of one particular aircraft is also American, one of several U.S. Navy officers sent to train the British. Through a break in the clouds, the Catalina pilot sees an unidentified battleship 700 miles west-northwest of Bress. It's leaking oil. The ship's anti-aircraft guns erupt in a mountain of fire, shaking the Catalina. As the pilot banks and climbs, the British co-pilot runs aft to transmit their discovery. Every ship on patrol drives straight for the Bismarck, but fuel is critical. If they make full speed, they may run out of petrol and have to break off, right. but if they slow, they might lose her. Hmm. And catching her is crucial. By the so next day, do? Bismarck will be safely in range of Luftwaffe air cover. The Royal Navy can't simultaneously battle Bismarck and fight off waves of bombers. The only ship close enough to strike a blow is the aircraft carrier Ark Royal. She speeds ahead to strike range. 1500 hours. Fifteen swordfish launch from the Ark Royal. The situation is dire. There's only time for two sorties before dark. New magnetic torpedoes sit beneath their plane's bellies. The crews have been briefed that Bismarck is the only ship in the sector. An hour later, they begin their attack run. 1610 hours. Under orders from Force H, the British cruiser Sheffield has rushed ahead to shadow Bismarck by radar. 
They've just acquired her when the lookouts hear aircraft engines. The swordfish flight bears down on them in an attack run. The HMS Sheffield's captain orders full speed and turns toward the planes, hoping to thread the torpedoes. Four of the swordfish realize their mistake and break off, but eleven release their payload. By a stroke of pure luck, a, the new torpedoes yeah. are faulty. Six oh. detonate on contact with the water, leaving the Sheffield only five to weave through. And she makes it, but barely. Returning to the Ark Royal, the demoralized pilots refuel and rearm for another run. They had two chances to damage Bismarck, and they just lost one of them by attacking their own ship. <laughs> yeah, Join us next time right. for one Blast. last attempt to stop oh. the largest warship on Earth. Okay. Well, yeah, they, they really drew out that battle there, but yeah, you got... Um, uh, I mean, they're, they think they can get it now. Right, they have found it. They've got a fleet going there. Time is really, really important because everyone's running out of fuel here. This seems to be like their their big chance, right? So, okay, okay, and that was even the title of that video: "A Chance to Strike," but haven't done so yet. So, all right. Well, there's one more video. Um, again, I haven't been commenting as much because I'm mostly just kind of taking it in. There's not much to add to it. I mean, they're just kind of telling the narrative there. Um, but no, this is, this is good. So, okay, let's go ahead and flip over real quick to video four. Okay. I think this is the last one. Uh, sink the Bismarck. Okay. We'll see what happens. A flight of swordfish speeds east toward the Bismarck. The hope of the Royal Navy rests on their wings. This episode is sponsored by Wargaming. New players can download World of Warships and use the code EXTRA1 for free goodies. Link in the description. 2047 hours. The 15 swordfish pilots know that this is their last shot. Yep, this is Soon it. it'll be dark, Otherwise, and by dawn the next day, again. the Bismarck will be in range of the Luftwaffe air bases on the French Got coast. Dawn coming. No okay. one else can get here in time. They sight the Bismarck and start their attack run, coming in piecemeal after a losing formation in the clouds. They fly low, some only 50 feet above the cresting waves. The Bismarck lights up with anti-aircraft fire, filling the air so thick with shells that the pilots hunch in their open cockpits. Crewmen scream as shrapnel tears their unprotected bodies. One swordfish mm. takes 175 hits, but they don't go down. Torpedoes hit the water. Wow. One strikes Bismarck on its thick armor belt. The great ship weaves and dodges. Huge waves send the tinfish at crazy angles. One pilot is about to loose when he hears his navigator yell, Not now! He turns to see the man hanging upside down from the side of the plane, judging wave patterns so that the <laughs> torpedo runs straight. Wow. Okay, let Imagine it Imagine that job. It's a textbook shot. Two ship lengths ahead. The Bismarck makes an evasive turn, but the torpedo strikes its stern. There's a blast of flame and water, but the great ship sails on, unaffected. As the bloodied swordfish crews climb out of their aircraft, they report that they've failed. But a report comes in saying that the Bismarck is behaving erratically. Okay. She hasn't recovered from her evasive turn and has circled northwest into the wind and directly away from the French coast. The torpedo knocked out her steering. The pilots erupt in celebration. Okay. The 27th of May, zero hundred hours on the King George V. Admiral Toby finally has the opportunity he's needed to close the jaws on Bismarck. Over the last few hours, he's ordered destroyers to bracket the ship in order to ensure that Bismarck doesn't escape again. A few have harassed it with torpedoes, one Polish destroyer flashing the message, I am a Pole, while firing. But mostly they're <laughs> keeping shoot. their distance. Don't There'll shoot! There'll be no night attack, Toby decides. Catching up will cost precious fuel, and Bismarck has proved too dangerous to fight in less than ideal conditions. He'll wait until morning. Oh, yeah, you, almost can't, you almost can't fight in traditional fashion. You have to, I don't know, do it a little bit uh, a little bit differently, right? you got to find other ways to do that, because you've seen which just the ship-to-ship -ship battles you know, how that's going to work out. And it's not going to work well for the British. Five hours, 48 degrees, 10 minutes north, 16 degrees, 15 minutes west. For the first time since beginning this mission, Tovey sees Bismarck with his own eyes. Behind him is the HMS Rodney, 
The Rodney is old, slow, and leaking below decks, but its 16-inch guns are the largest in the Royal Navy. Okay. Though barely They're able to, to maneuver, guns. Bismarck's guns are still fully operational. Tovey's plan is to approach Bismarck from all sides, forcing the ship to split its fire between his four ships, the battleships King George V yeah, and Rodney, and smart. the cruisers Dorsetshire and Norfolk. But first, the battleships must drive in hard from the west with only their forward turrets firing, the same maneuver that doomed the hood. The Rodney opens fire at a range of 12 miles. Spray leaps up in front of the Bismarck, high enough that it spoils the targeting on King George V's first salvo. Right. Three minutes no later, Bismarck answers, its opening salvo landing all around Rodney. Back and forth, the three ships trade fire, the Rodney and King George V plunging forward at top speed in the heavy seas. The pace renders the Rodney's engine room nearly uninhabitable. Crewmen hose her overheating boilers down with seawater. Every salvo blows there. the boiler doors open with a rush of flame. And each curtain of fire from the Bismarck creeps closer to the Rodney. On the Bismarck's third salvo, fountains of water bracket the old ship. Shrapnel lances through her superstructure. The Rodney is dead to rights, expecting a hit. But then she fires. The 16-inch shell smashes into Bismarck's main fire control director. Ooh. Her guns fall quiet Good in hit. the absence of orders. The British battleships turn and split up, surrounding the Bismarck, pounding her with broadsides from two angles. After a pause, the Bismarck turns slightly to put King George V in view of its undamaged aft fire director, its salvos barely missing Toby's flagship. But the British have found their range. Three minutes after her first hit, Rodney nails Bismarck's B turret, penetrating the armor with a blast so powerful, the concussion temporarily knocks neighboring A turret out of action. Bismarck's counterfire dwindles, each turret firing erratically and independently. Now even Tovey's cruisers have joined the pummeling. The 8-inch guns of Norfolk and Dorsetshire are too small to sink the Bismarck, but they tear through its unarmored upper decks. The Bismarck's superstructure begins to come apart. An ammunition locker explodes. The fire director station flies Ooh. through the air like a kicked can. Flames reach as high as the mainmast. The bridge this collapses. The beginning of the forward. end. By 0930 hours, Bismarck's four great turrets have fired their last salvo, and shots from her secondary guns dwindle. The Rodney closes to point blank range, 2,000 yards, and begins slamming broadsides into the hull. Three fires rage on Bismarck's deck. Holes appear in the upper hull. So many shells are pounding the bow that it's red hot, hissing with steam every right. time it plunges into the heavy sea. Watching through binoculars, Royal Navy officers see a little trickle of men emerge from Bismarck. They run along the deck, sheltering behind the blasted turrets or jumping in bunches into the sea. For many of the British, it's the first time they've seen the enemy. It sickens them. German sailors try to signal surrender, but the next volley cuts them down. Aboard the Rodney, a chaplain tearfully begs the ship's captain to stop, but their orders are clear. The Bismarck must be sunk. Yet the ship stubbornly refuses to go under. Tovey's ships the circle, sailors know hammering it's going her with down. every weapon they have, pounding away until the stress of their guns shatter Taking windows and open leaks in their own ships. For 50 minutes, they dismember the Bismarck, firing over 2,800 shells. At 10.21 hours, the guns go quiet. Tovey's ships have expended so much fuel that they're in danger of not being able to get back home. Tovey orders his ships to make for Scapa Flow. The Dorsetshire will finish the Bismarck. Dorsetshire moves to point-blank range and fires two torpedoes into scary. the Bismarck's starboard side close. and another into the port side. The pride of Hitler's fleet heals over, her lower hull glowing from internal fires and gradually sinks by the stern. Within 15 seconds, she's gone. The Dorsetshire throws nets over its side to pick up German survivors. Her sailors try to haul as many as they can aboard, but some are badly burned or missing limbs. Remember in the, um, was it the hood that sank? Um, or was the other one? I forgot, I forget the, got, maybe got the names mixed up. Where it sunk and only three British sailors were, were pulled out. That was, that was crazy. Looks like they're gonna be able to recover more though. This time, or for the for the Bismarck. Safe on deck, crewmen hand their half-frozen enemies rum and hot coca, pity eclipsing their anger over the loss of the hood. 
But then a lookout spots a U-boat periscope. Ooh. German submarines are known to converge on sinking ships, and in order to save his crew, the Dorsetshire's captain gives an unthinkable order. Whoa. Unless they want to join the Bismarck, they must get underway. The ship begins to pull forward with hundreds of whaling men still oh. floating around her. Some cling to the nets as she begins to move, losing their grip and drifting to stern as she gains speed. Whoa. 2,200 men served on Bismarck. Only 114 wow. survived. Let's look at those numbers too. Yeah, 2,200, 114. So they were actually getting... So they were getting... They were pulling more out, um, but then the, the German U-boats are approaching, so they're like, no, nah, we're not sticking around for this. Wow. Well, the time is 1,200 hours. Churchill tells Parliament that the Bismarck has been sunk. The news goes out via radio minutes later, greeted by three cheers in the Bletchley Park canteen. It's a major victory for the Codebreakers, proof that their program can deliver results. The victory comes at a crucial time. It distracts the press from Royal Navy losses in the Mediterranean, and signals to the U.S. Congress, still divided over American convoys, that the Royal Navy can defend American shipping. In Germany, propagandists spin the Bismarck sinking as a noble last stand, but Hitler receives a different message. He's never trusted naval power. Capital ships are mm. too expensive, too vulnerable to air raids, and their loss is too public. Plus, they gobble up Germany's wrong, limited right? fuel resources. The Royal Navy could have the Atlantic. From now on, he would use his capital ships defensively, and employ U-boats to harass convoys. After all, his focus was needed elsewhere. In three weeks, Germany's forces would invade the Soviet Union, uh, and he'd Barbarossa. have plenty of time to deal with the troublesome English once he'd captured Moscow. Or so he thought. Damn. Thanks again to Wargaming for sponsoring these episodes. siddler has got, he's got much, everyone. much bigger, if you much bigger fish to fry with the Soviet Union here. Um, you gotta know the timeline quite between the two there. Um, but yeah, Operation Barbarossa about to commence. What they say, three weeks. That's the invasion of um, of Russia. So yeah, so it's kind of like rather than I guess go, he's gonna pout about it or whatever. Be like, no, oh, that was such a blow. He's gonna be like, yeah, I didn't care anyways. I didn't care about the Navy anyways, right? We're 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 a land power. You know what I mean? So I mean, how else would you respond? You know, just this devastating loss that you publicly mourn. You know what I mean? Um, maybe for the humanitarian purpose you, you could, but no. All right. Well, great. You know, that was a very detailed, uh, account, you know, for, for the whole process. Um, I've noticed that with, uh, the extra credits people here that they, they really do go in, a, um, um, a lot of detail at that obviously must come from, must be a lot of whether it's journal entries or just uh, military logs because they got it like down to the minute and all these different things and uh, I think it'd be interesting to kind of go through those sources and see see exactly where that comes from um, but yeah that would be uh, the big to know um, in the first video I was asking uh, about the German perspective of this whole thing and everything here was obviously from the British perspective but I think it'd be interesting to know um, what perspective from from the Germans even though it was 114 were survi uh, survived um, are there are there some good uh, primary sources from the Germans from from sailors there or from the command out there I think that'd be interesting to to definitely check out so yeah interesting story of how much effort and how long it took for you know the British Navy which is like the most powerful Navy in the world and, and, and in history pretty much and you know how how much trouble it had with this just this behemoth of a ship um but yeah it looks like as uh, i'm really more less interested in a lot of details about history and really look at cause and effect relationships and the effect it looks like was which is important it's the most important thing is that the germans will kind of it looks like kind of stop with um some of the more offensive movements for navy and try to just stay more defensive Right, and that's 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 a pretty smart move, I think, on their behalf. As as at this point in the war, they were doing so well on the ground. Um, but yeah, that's that's I think the most important thing and uh, to learn about history is cause and effect relationships. Right? Okay. Okay. Well, awesome. Um, just to plug a few things now, the link to the original video will be down in the description. If you liked it, give them a a, a view, like, subscribe. 
um, if you liked the video here. Um, if you liked joining me here uh, as a history teacher, trying to continue to learn more and more about history, um, be sure to subscribe. Uh, I do a lot of live premieres, so if you'd like to join us uh, in live premieres, also might be good to um, click on the notifications. There are some ways you can support this channel. Um, there is the Patreon that you may join. A link will be uh, in the description below. Um, one of the perks of uh, joining our Patreon um, uh, kind of group there is uh, I do a weekly poll with uh, possible videos to watch and uh, Patreon members get to uh, choose uh, regardless of what your pledge level is. Just a little thank you for, for supporting the channel as well. There's also ways to donate through Streamlabs and through the Super Chats and live channels. Um, all, all are you know very well appreciated, of course never required. All right, with that, um, I think we'll go ahead and call it here. Really enjoyed learning about um, the Bismarck here, and uh, and um, I don't know I, I just it's it's a really neat story um, to see that, and uh, hopefully um, there's still more to learn about it. So, all right, with that, I think we'll go ahead and end it here. Um, thanks again for joining. We'll see you soon.